in this room, if you're like me, you came of age with the conventional wisdom that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But we now have more than 20 years of peer-reviewed research to tell us that far more often the opposite is true. We know that trauma in childhood and adversity can leave long-lasting scars, and neuroscientists have been peering into the human body and brain to show us so many things that I'm going to share with you here today. And the way in which adversity can change the cells in our body, the neurons in our brain, and leave scars even in our DNA that lead to illness and mental health problems, and yes, addiction long into adulthood. So I mentioned that Felitti and Anda were shocked as to how common adversity in childhood was. But what really floored them and stunned them was that the number of categories of adverse childhood experiences that someone had predicted their adult health outcome. Four or more categories of ACEs are related to being two and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with cancer or lung disease, four and a half times more likely to develop depression or Alzheimer's, and 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. And six or more ACEs took 20 years off an individual's lifespan. So I want to talk about sex differences just for a minute here because it's an interesting part of the research. Girls face more ACEs. This makes some sense because we know that girls in our society are physically smaller growing up in the home. They often have less societal power, less equality in family life, and they're more vulnerable and more likely to be victims of physical, sexual, emotional abuse and harassment. Here's a mind-blowing statistic from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. For each category of ACEs a girl experiences, her chance of being hospitalized in adulthood with an autoimmune disease increases by 20%. So that means that the risk between being female and facing ACEs in, adult, in childhood and later developing a serious autoimmune disease is statistically as significant as the link between smoking and lung cancer. Now, I could go into this in great depth. I can tell you it has to do with the fantastic hormone estrogen and the way in which women's bodies are primed to carry another life. And that's a really good thing because it means if a woman is pregnant, your immune system is poised to do a lot of work to keep you and your baby safe. But it also means that women have a more robust immune response, including to social threats and chronic stressors, which means over the lifespan, an increased risk of autoimmune and other disorders. So as a science journalist and researcher, one of my big questions when I first came across the ACE study was what is the biophysical link between trauma in childhood and later adult physical and mental health disorders? What's going on in the cells and in the brain? So of course, you might assume that individuals who grew up with a lot of trauma might have more of what we call poor health risk behaviors or high health risk behaviors. Perhaps they're not taking care of themselves, drinking, using drugs, engaging in behaviors that are more likely to lead to poor health. And Felitti and Anda had that question too. And so they separated out the research in a way that they could look at that directly. And it turned out that that was not the only reason for these pathways of disease. Even in individuals who didn't drink or smoke, they weren't overweight, they didn't have high cholesterol, they did not report any high health risk behaviors, those with an ACE score of seven still had a 360% higher risk of heart disease. And that tells us that something's going on other than poor health risk habits. What is it? When kids don't know when the stress is coming, they are caught in the first half of the stress cycle. And guess what that does? It creates a state of biological implausibility. 
Kids cannot run to mommy if mommy is scary. And they know, even a three-year-old knows, they cannot run away out into the street, that the world's not safe. And this puts kids in a state of hypervigilance, that first half of the stress cycle, and they can't get out of it. Neuroscience and medicine have helped us understand that the majority of our genes are not fixed. They're in a constant dance with the environment around us. And I like to think of it this way that our genes are really kind of like flowers. In a good, healthy environment, our genes are going to flower in a way so that our genes can ideally manage everything that our body needs to do to stay healthy on this planet. But in kids who faced adversity, some of the petals don't open. Those genes aren't functioning. They're not flowering properly. And when that happens, these genes, that oversee the stress response, they turn on the stress response, and they get stuck. They set the stress response to high for life. Think about all those inflammatory chemicals your body pumps out when you see the bear. The stress response gets set on high for life. The adversity that a child faces doesn't have to be what we might think of traditionally as severe abuse for it to result in biophysical changes in, a body, in a, the body and brain of a developing child. In labs around the country, researchers have been trying to figure out why this is. And I spent some time in a lab at the University of Maryland where they were working to figure out how chronic unpredictable stress changes the brain in a way that expected stress doesn't. And so I just have to say this, an apology to the mice in this experiment, because none of us like that, right? Um, so they will take mice, and they will give mice a little shock on their left foot every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. And those mice, guess what they do? They go, shock's coming, first half of the stress cycle, done, second half of the stress cycle. They show no epigenetic changes to the genes that oversee the production of stress and inflammatory hormones. Well, they take another group of mice and they start introducing random stress, nothing major. Um, Tuesday at midnight, there'll be a strobe light going on in the room where the mice are. And then maybe Thursday afternoon, three o'clock, they'll wet the mice bedding. Mice really don't like that. That's very stressful for them. And then maybe 36 or 48 hours later, they'll introduce another type of stress and they'll put the, the cage on a rocker. And it'll just rock a little bit. These are not big stressors. The mice aren't in pain. They're just having things happen that make them feel unsafe. And guess what happens in their brains? Those genes that oversee the stress response they change. The stress response gets stuck on high. So at the top, you can see those are typical neuron connections. Synapses are firing. Neurons are sending messages to each other that help us to interpret and perceive the world around us in appropriate ways. But at the bottom, kids who are having toxic stress, they have fewer connections. The neurons aren't firing and wiring together in the way that we want them to. Certain circuits are going offline. But what in the world is going on? That is a 300-year medical mystery. How is it that the stress immune system is connected to a loss of synaptic connectivity in the brain? How is that possible? Now, for 300 years, researchers have thought that the brain was the only organ in the body that could not be touched by the human immune system. And it all turns out to come down to one tiny little cell called microglia. So just remember that. I know it's a new word, microglia. You're going to be hearing a ton about it in the next few years because it turns out that this powerful little immune cell has been hiding in plain sight. For 100 years, researchers at NIH and other labs thought that this was a boring housekeeper cell. All it did was it carted away dead neurons when they died in the brain. But it turns out 
that microglia are actually immune cells. They've been hiding in the brain all this time. When a fetus is in development, these little tiny microglial cells break off from our white blood cells, our immune cells. They migrate up to the brain, and there they reside for the rest of a person's lifetime, and all of medicine missed it until, in 2016, a Harvard researcher, Beth Stevens, began to look more closely at these cells, and guess what she found? They are activated just like your immune system by toxic stressors, by pathogens, by infections. They morph into big, bushy Pac-Men, and they go through the brain and they eat synapses. They can see synapses in the belly of traumatized microglia. So a 300-year mystery has just been solved by researchers, which explains this correlation between chronic stress in childhood, the loss of synapses in a developing child's brain, and the later result of mental health disorders. The good news is that in healthy, nurturing environments, microglia are what we call the angels of the brain. They secrete good, juicy neuron, uh, nutrients to help our neurons be healthy and synapses to be healthy. I think of them kind of like the way they cater to neurons the way that an entourage caters to a movie star. But in unhealthy environments, under chronic stress, under toxic stress, they're the brain's untimely assassins. So this gives us a really new and important understanding of why early trauma can lead to psychiatric disorders and, early, and addiction. Something that affected the behavior of microglial immune cells, just like in the immune system in the body, may set us up for anxiety or behavioral disorders or depression or bipolar disorder or addiction in the teenage years and they are very linked to Alzheimer's later in life. How do we harness the power of all this really scary science in ways that help us to intervene and help families and parents and practitioners? Anybody ready for the good news? Yes. <laughs> and the news is fantastic. The brain is very plastic. We can turn bad epigenetics into good epigenetics. We can regrow these neural connections and synapses. It's never too late to make a change. We used to think zero to three, and then we thought zero to 18, and then we thought the brain is plastic to 25. Guess what? It's plastic as long as you are taking a breath. A child's history of connectedness is a better predictor of their lifelong health than their history of adversity. The number one most protective factor is consistent, protective, reliable, supportive relationships with caring adults. We know that kids who've had ACEs, they find resiliency because an adult provides a safe environment in which they feel known and seen and validated. And right, in a perfect world, this is going to be a parent, for sure. But it can be a grandparent, it can be a mentor, it can be a teacher, it can be a counselor, it can be a coach, it can be a social worker. And I can tell you, having worked with many individuals who have had trauma, that even decades later, kids recall in technicolor those adults who came into their lives during difficult periods of time and with whom they felt and safe and known and worthy. Now, we know that kids thrive best when the adults around them are managing their own stuff. The most powerful thing that we can do to re-regulate a child's brain is to be well-regulated and self-regulated as adults. Thanks to the annals of neuroscience, we can now peer into a child's brain and see what turns off the fight-flight response. And here is one of the easiest things on the planet. If you, as the adult, helping a child, whether in your own kitchen or in a clinic, if you make a mistake, make a repair. The quicker that an adult makes a repair, the faster the amygdala stops lighting up, and the less likely it is that an unhappy memory will stick. How many of you in this room are parents? 
How many of you have never said something you regret? <laughs> yeah, right? So, guess what? You flip your lid, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You don't want your kid to remember it 30 years later and throw it back at you? <laughs> Make it a quick repair. I'm sorry I lost it. I flipped my lid. That must have scared you. They go from that first half of the stress cycle, the amygdala stops lighting up, and they get all calm and comfy. Let's just talk about what we know about the biological benefit of human connection. This is really the superpower of the human race. We are the only species that can, by close physical proximity, begin to change each other's brains in real time. So let's break this down into scientific theory. This all emerges from what we call polyvagal theory. Polyvagal theory tells us that even very simple things like eye contact with a child helps soothe the stress response. And that's because it stimulates what we call the vagus nerve, which runs from the back of your brain all the way down, regulating your heart rate, how much you sweat, your body temperature, even your digestion. Another really simple thing that tames the brain and causes the amygdala to stop sending all those messages is naming different emotions as they are happening. So for instance, helping kids. Are you feeling mad, sad, or afraid? Guess what? That just gets the brain to calm down. Ask them, what happened was really scary. Are you feeling scared? Ask them to be very specific in naming their emotions. And I'll throw out one other thing from the latest annals of neuroscience. If this works for adults too, right? So if you are feeling angry or lonely or scared or anxious, that will help your amygdala to calm down. And very recently, researchers in California found that if you add your name in the third person, your amygdala stops lighting up. We don't know why this works, but let's say I were really nervous standing up here. If I said, Donna, you're anxious, it's OK. My amygdala stops lighting up. You might give it a try. Meditators also show changes to the genes that oversee the stress response. Researchers have been able to find that those same genes that turn the stress response on high and get stuck there under trauma, re-regulate and can turn the stress response on and off again as nature intended in people who meditate regularly for eight weeks. And I just want to end with this one quote that it's been said that if child abuse and neglect were to disappear today, the diagnostic and statistical manual would shrink to the size of a pamphlet in two generations, and the prisons would empty. Thank you so much for coming today. I so appreciate it.